Hey, today we're in the Gospel of John, chapter 3. I'm reading from the New King James Translation, and last time we finished up chapter 2. Jesus had begun his public ministry, helping people in many miraculous ways, showing his love to them, teaching in synagogues. Um, he'd also clean, clean the temple out, cleared the temple out of the corruption that had crept into the, the Passover celebration over the years. And um, it really sparked a lot of interest, as we've seen in, in the people that, that were there, kind of uh, brought out mixed emotions in the Jewish leaders. And, and today we're going to begin our, our text in chapter 3. And this is really, seems to be one of the most important ones in, in the entire gospel. I know a lot of people... Um, when they you know, introduce the scriptures to someone else, the person's, you know, the person says, what do I do? Well, how do I read it? Or, or where do I read? And they all, a lot of people say, start in John. And um, this is one of the reasons. Very quickly in John, we get, they get to chapter 3, and we find many essential ideas to the faith are explained in this passage. They're brought up, they're explained, um, including the role of Jesus as Savior. And that's obviously really important. It makes it clear that Christ and Christ alone provides a salvation for the entire world. This text also talks about those that reject Jesus um, and reject God. And a lot of the concepts that we're talking about in this chapter have been introduced in the past two chapters and in past teachings. And I'm not going to go over all the details of those again, but you can look back on the recordings um, that we have of those and but we're going to continue to dig in. We'll find deeper meanings as we explore chapter 3, starting at verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus, and that, Jesus answered and said unto him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you. Y'all remember that phrase from last time, right? <laughs> Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel? And do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen. And you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Now, how many times in this, in this passage does Jesus say, uh, most assuredly, I say to you, or some scriptures Verily, verily, I say unto you, or some, some translations, truly, truly, I say to you. This is a super important. In just a few verses, he said this three times. This is like, put the radar on, take notes, write this down, put this in your life. So there's so much good stuff in these verses. But let's take a look first at this man who came to Jesus. Unlike those that we read about in the last two verses of, of chapter 2, um, who just developed a general belief that maybe Jesus is the Messiah or yeah, he might be the one or he's a, probably a good teacher. Nicodemus was obviously a deeper thinker. He'd heard Jesus' teachings. He'd seen his miracles. And I'd like to think that he was probably one of those that were, were cheering on Jesus as the temple was being cleansed. And most people would have addressed him as rabbi, just as he addresses Jesus in this passage in verse 2. Now, we know he was a Pharisee. John calls him a ruler of the Jews. That means that he was a member of the Sanhedrin under the authority of the Romans in that time. We're not told whether he was on the, the 20, a 23-member local council. doesn't tell us where he's from, so he might have been on that. But he was probably on the 71-member, the big council, great Sanhedrin that was over all of Israel. Kind of a big deal um, since he was there, since this was taking place in Jerusalem. So that's probably what he was a part of. Now, Nicodemus was an, an ancient version, an ancient equivalent of uh, a politician, a priest, and a professor, all rolled into one. The Pharisees were legalistic. We, we think of that a lot, but they were extremely moral Jews. They formed a brotherhood to, to hold themselves and other people accountable to follow the laws of Moses. And their commitment to, to purity 
in, the, in following the laws led them to add hundreds of new rules and clarifications and, and laws to the laws that Moses had given in, in, the, in the Torah, uh, just to cover all possible situations. And so they had a lot that they had to, to, to process. And today, the, the term Pharisee gets a lot of criticism. Back in their day, Pharisees were honored for their religious commitment, for their knowledge of the law, being well-versed in religious concepts and the scriptures. Um, and so that's what's happening here in this private nighttime conversation with Jesus. Um, Jesus gently, but also quite firmly, shows this man that he didn't quite understand faith in God like he thought he did. So, you know, gently burst his bubble. Well, I don't know how gently it was, but, you know, it depends on how Nicodemus was taking it. But his life changes as he's listening to Jesus. So our life lesson, our first life lesson here to note is that as, as we listen, as you listen to Jesus, your life will change. As you listen to Jesus, your life will change. Now, despite of the negative use that we, we use the term Pharisee, Today, not all the Pharisees were hard-hearted and unreachable. Nicodemus is direct proof of this. Uh, he recognized the divine origin of Jesus' power, as we just heard him tell in verse 2. Later on in chapter 7, he'll actually go on to defend Jesus in front of the other Pharisees. And after the crucifixion, he'll donate embalming materials after uh, when, when Jesus needs to be buried. So we see that. We also see Joseph of Arimathea most likely was in the same situation. So there were believers... Um, but as a whole, they weren't real happy with Jesus. So it's quite likely this, actual, this, this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus was much longer than what we read here in chapter 3. Uh, we're only covering part of it today, and it'll take one or two more weeks to, to dig, dig out the rest of it. But um, I'm just thinking, what an amazing opportunity that we have recorded here. I kind of would have liked to have been on the fly on the wall, wherever they were at during that. Probably they may have been breaking bread together. I don't know. But it would have been cool to be there and, and listen to all of these things and, and watch the faces of, of Nicodemus and those that, that were some of Jesus' disciples with them um, as, as these things were revealed. And um, as we, we look in these convers this conversation, it's very useful to, for us to know how people come to Jesus and how... They can respond. What's happening inside? A lot of times we, we emphasize what, how they're responding on outwardly. But we're going to see some of the things that are happening inside Nicodemus as we, as we cover part of this today. Now, we know Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. And we're not told why. My first thought is that Nicodemus was busy. He was, you know, all these things. Judge, ruler, uh, you know, Pharisee, teacher studier you know he had all these things going on and it's like okay i'm busy and also jesus without you know teaching he was healing people he was you know helping people out in any way he could and so i'm thinking my first thought is that yeah they were busy you know as a businessman i think that way he's like okay i can i can only meet you like at 8 30 at night okay but some people say other things others speculate the pharisees were already bad-mouthing jesus probably was happening too and Nicodemus may have been afraid of, of having an open and honest conversation out in public during the daytime when everybody else was watching this. So that could have been it. It could have been that others may not have considered appropriate for a man of Nicodemus stature to be going and asking advice from this itinerant preacher from Galilee. So um, we know, no, you know, I find it interesting in verse 2, he says, he, he didn't say, I know, or I perceive, but he said, we know. That kind of gives me a clue that it's not just Nicodemus that is saying, we know you're sent from God, we know that God is working in you. But he's saying, there's some of us here. So he, I don't think he was the only one, and I, I think he was kind of representing some others that said, hey, go check him out, see if he really is the, who he says he is. So in any case, when we get to heaven, we can ask him because I'm really sure that Nicodemus found his way and became a true believer in Jesus. So let's read in verse two again. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now at this point, we only see a statement. Now, 
it's a very positive statement. And really, for where he was at, his position, he was making a bold statement of faith. You know, it's kind of like, almost like you know, repeating the Apostles' Creed or, or something similar to that, and saying, this is what I believe and who I believe you are. Now, whether there's an unrecorded question there, we don't know at this point, but Jesus knew what he was getting at. And we see in verse three, Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, born again, you have to be born again to see the kingdom of God. That C is kind of interesting too. There's so much here. So first, um, we see the concept of being born into the family of God. Just like in John 1, 12 to 13, we read, that, but as many as received him, Jesus, to them, he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Now we're talking about the same new birth here. Born again, born of the will of God. And a perfectly legitimate alternate translation here, uh, in, in verse 3, would be born from above. There's several nuances to this concept, but yes, it could be translated born again, also translated born from above. In many versions, you see that. I, I kind of like the Amplified, uh, uses both terms and, and actually adds even a little bit, little bit more in there to make sure the term is clear and unmistakable. The Amplified, it says in verse 3, Jesus answered him, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, unless a person is born again, reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, sanctified, set apart, he cannot ever see and experience the kingdom of God. So that kind of lays all of it out. <laughs> no matter which meaning that Nicodemus took, it was quite clear that he still didn't quite understand. He kind of confused as to what was going on here. Um, because, you know, he's thinking, well, I don't think he means going finding my mama and climbing back inside and starting all over again. But, you know, how can I be born again? So verse four, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now, I like this. No, I don't. Some may think that was almost a sarcastic remark. I don't think so. I think he was just honestly expressed. I don't know what's going on here. And our life lesson for us today is when you don't quite understand what God is saying to you, ask him questions and look for his answers. When you don't quite understand what God is saying to you, ask him questions and look for his answers. Now, what was happening to Nicodemus at this time actually was pretty marvelous. He didn't understand what was really happening to him and Jesus recognized that, that he was, uh, Nicodemus was going against the trend of his peers that he'd likely be ridiculed by some of his comrades and associates, uh, but he had at least enough guts to go and, you know, come to Jesus, find out what's going on, and tell him, yes, I believe your teaching. And, uh, you know, it was, it was something inside of him that was causing him to go to the point that probably put him on the edge of losing or maybe even sacrificing and losing all the stuff he'd worked for in his entire life with this group of uh, the Sanhedrin and the other Pharisees. He'd gone beyond the stage of belief that says, you know, I think Jesus might be the Messiah or Jesus is quite a remarkable person. No, he's the, he progressed to Jesus is the Messiah, the son sent by God, worthy to be trusted, worthy to be relied upon with his life. It's like Jesus was saying to him in his response, because you really recognize and are truly believing in me as the Messiah sent from God, you're being born from above, from above, not by the will of man, but by the will of God. You're starting to see the kingdom of God. And unless the same thing happens to a person, he can't see the kingdom of God. This is the starting point. That's why we see Jesus open up and then he goes into much greater detail with Nicodemus. Verse five, Jesus answered, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Born of water typically will indicate a physical birth as a child coming from the womb. Um, as Nicodemus refers to by his questions, uh, I, I learned that on my very first child as, uh, <laughs> as, as my wife was standing 
getting ready to go in church and all of a sudden there was lots of water. So our first child was definitely born of water. <laughs> the second meaning of this born of water is to be born as a result of hearing the word of God. The Bible talks about being washed by the water of the word of God. And that also is a, a something else. I think that's kind of a parallel meaning it has there. Um, we have some people will say that that born of water also means that they were baptized and then reborn by the Spirit of God, but that's kind of backwards. <laughs> you know, you believe and you, you know, you're part of the family of God and then you show it with baptism. So I don't really think that applies in this situation. And there's a lot of places in scriptures that talk about coming to belief in God and, and being saved and salvation without saying you have to be baptized. Now, absolutely obey God and do what he says, be baptized. But I don't think that's, uh, that's not what Jesus is saying here. Now, being washed by the word of God, being hearing the word of God, and then believing in the word of God, that's what happened to Nicodemus. It progresses perfectly to be born, being born of the spirit of God. And then Jesus breaks it down even further to make no mistake. Um, he says, that which is born of the flesh is just flesh. He doesn't say just, but that's what he's saying. It's flesh is flesh. Uh, reminded me of Isaiah, I mean, of Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5, that says, Thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. So you can't trust in the flesh. In fact, it's a curse to man. But you're born into the flesh and it will eventually die. And if you trust the flesh, you're cursed. That's what it's saying. But when you're born of the Spirit of God, you are also of the Spirit of God. And you don't have the curse of flesh on that in your life. Uh, in the earlier teaching, we reviewed a lot of what it meant to be born of God, to be born from above or born again. And again, you can review that. But I'm sure a lot of what was going through Nicodemus' mind as he tried to process this new information was, you know, still, you know, still gelling. Probably more conversation was taking place between him and Jesus. And you've got to remember here that the Jewish people depended really heavily on being born into Abraham's family for salvation. I mean, that's where salvation was. The heathen nations were heathen because they didn't, they weren't Jews. And sometimes people could convert, but you didn't find them generally out there trying to convert people. Um, even today, you don't find a lot of Jewish people out, you know, say, hey, you need to be a Jew. Come believe our faith. And yet God tells them over and over the signs that were done as in, in the Old Testament, the signs that were done saving the people, the signs that were done to overcome um, evil. All of that you see in every passage that it says something along the line of, then they will know that I am the Lord. And he'll, you know, he'll, he says his name. So you know, so people will know that your God is the true God of heaven. And yet, it didn't really happen that way. In the temple, the court of the Gentiles that we saw uh, before, where all the Gentiles were supposed to be able to come in, pray, worship God, see the glory of God, what were they doing there? They were selling doves and sheep and goats and whatever else you know, <laughs> they could find. And they were changing money, ripping people off. They were not following what God had intended. So anyway, they were depending on being, uh, and Nicodemus was, I'm sure, well steeped in that as a member of the Sanhedrin court. He'd also seen all kinds of evil in the Jewish people. I mean, that's what you go to court for. You know, someone wrongs another person, someone kills another person, hurts them, maims them, steals from them, you know, breaks one of these, one of the commandments of God meant to, to show love to your brother. And these people came to the court and, um, uh, He'd seen these bad things, and you know he'd also seen some of the, a lot of the good, and he knew that they probably didn't really jive in his mind. It really didn't, you know, equate that um, all of these are going to have the same ending. You know, all of these people are going to be saved just because one of their ancestors was Abraham. So you know, I know in your family you don't have some that are bad and some that are good, but most families do. <laughs> so. Um, once you try to draw a line between the good and the not so good, you realize that nobody can keep all the commandments all of the time. And that's the purpose of the law. We find that uh, in the scriptures. And we saw, see actually not once, but twice in Psalms, Psalm 14 and Psalm 53, 
The verses 1 and 2 say, The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have become, they have together become corrupt. There is none who does good, no, not one. So that pretty much settles it. So far it is, okay, who's good enough to get to heaven? Raise your hand. Everybody's, mm, not me. But now Jesus, the Messiah, was saying that just being born is not enough. Okay, if I don't know if Nicodemus had studied out these verses in Psalms, and you know, oh, if there's none that's good, how are we gonna how are we gonna get salvation? But Jesus was making it very clear. Being born is not enough. Doesn't matter who who you're born into, and um, what family. But then Jesus said you had to be born again of the Spirit of God. Now I don't think Nick caught it that Nicodemus caught it at that moment, but. This also gives hope to the rest of the world at this point. Jesus didn't say, unless one is born of water into Abraham's family and born of the Spirit, did he? Thank God there was no ethnic or tribal limitation to this statement. Now, as a Gentile, I'm especially thankful. <laughs> but everybody can be thankful for that. Suddenly, the conversation turned to all humans that could be born of the Spirit of God and experience and see the kingdom of God. Our life lesson here is, it's not your religion that allows you to experience the kingdom of God. It's your relationship with Jesus. It's not your religion that allows you to experience the kingdom of God. It's your relationship with Jesus. So Jesus' nighttime visitor here was getting a lot more than he'd expected when he first came. And I think he was overwhelmed by it and still wanting to hear more. And Jesus told him... Uh, Verse 7, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. So marvel means to be held in wonder or astonishment, to hold in great admiration. And I think Nicodemus was all of those. He was astonished by the way the, all these thoughts came together in his mind as he was thinking of the, the things that Jesus was unlocking in his, in his mind. And, um, he, was, he was in wonder as he sensed something happening inside his heart. He was in great admiration, of course, for Jesus who recognized these things without having to be told all these things that were in, in Nicodemus' heart and what he was wondering about, Jesus was just, you know, answering and explaining away. And at the same time, sometimes gently chiding him in his teaching of the law. So then Jesus went on to explain something in a, I think, a pretty eloquent way as he perceived what was in Nicodemus' heart. And then um, this convinces me at this point that this man was, in fact, being reborn by the Spirit of God during this conversation. And that is verse 8. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes and where it goes. It comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. So here Jesus compares the saving work of God through his Spirit to the working of the wind. You know, I, just, I, I picture sometimes a gentle breeze blowing, and I picture a couple of weeks ago here, the trees bowing down to the wind <laughs> as they were about to blow them over, and then sometimes it's just still. And you're longing for that wind to blow. So, you know, that's the way the Spirit works as well. Um, the comparison is, is also memorable for those that were there because the Greek word for wind is the word, if I say this close, puna, puma, puma, something along that line, okay? The word for spirit is the word puma. It's the same word, wind and spirit. And it depended on how the word was, was followed up, where it was in context, whether it meant wind or spirit. So it was really cool. It was like, okay, just like the wind with this, just like the pneuma, so was the pneuma. <laughs> so they couldn't, it was brilliant, eloquent passage. Of course, it's saying the effects of the wind can't be seen. The wind itself can't be seen, but you see what it does. And it just blows and takes care of business. It does what it wants to do. Um, the same holds true for being born of the Spirit of God. Jesus wanted Nicodemus to know that he didn't have to understand everything. He couldn't have to see everything about this new birth before he experienced it. A person doesn't strive or work to manipulate the Spirit of God. And a lot of times he doesn't see how that's working. It's, it's rare to find someone that's actually chasing down the Spirit of God to, found, to find salvation. We generally don't chase down the wind to see what it's going to do. Yet... Like the wind, when the spirit moves, working in ways we don't see, everything comes together. Comes together, things come together at the right time. He brings about that new birth in life 
in your life and the effects are evident. We know it is the work of the Spirit of God and with unseen, unseen with the eyes, but definitely felt and experienced by the seeker. In this sense, neither Nicodemus nor anybody else can save themselves. Salvation is the work of God in a receptive life that is brought about by the Holy Spirit. Our life lesson here is a little long, but good. Life lesson is, just as you are sensitive to the wind as it moves, be sensitive to the Spirit of God and recognize the effects of His work in your life and in others. Just as you are sensitive to the wind as it moves, be sensitive to the Spirit of God and recognize the effects of His work in your life and in others. Nicodemus was amazed, he was intrigued, um, he was perplexed all at the same time. He was wanting to understand but still couldn't quite put all the pieces together. And finally, verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Verse 10, Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? A little, little jab there, you know, you're the teacher of Israel. You're a Pharisee, you're a righteous, you're a Sanhedrin judge, supposed to be full of wisdom and discernment in this verse. We also learned that he was not just a teacher of the scriptures, but what did Jesus say there? You are the teacher of the scriptures, knowing them inside and out, constantly studying them. Um, probably, when he says you're the teacher of the law, he must have been the lead, one of the lead teachers or a lead teacher. And, and yet, um, all this going for him, he still had missed some of the clues, the scriptures, and the prophecies that had pointed to what Jesus was saying. A little bit of homework for you. Read this passage this week. Study this, this passage with the things that Jesus is talking about, and then go and try to find in the Old Testament all of the scriptures that are referring to these things, about being born of the Spirit, being born again, having a new life, and, and, and those things we've talked about. Um, it'll be quite an interesting journey for you. Okay, but Jesus then goes on to verify to Nicodemus the truthfulness and the importance of the words he was speaking. For the fourth time, <laughs> most assuredly I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen and you don't receive our witness. I'm, there he's saying, you know, you don't fully understand that yet. You, don't, you haven't quite caught all of it yet. It's not saying you don't believe anything we're saying. He's saying you don't understand what we're saying yet. And then verse 12, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? So, yeah, I don't think he was really scolding them here. I, I think he was emphasizing that he wasn't just talking about a theological theory here. Um, I'm sure you've never been in a church like this, but sometimes you go to a church and they, they talk about, and they use big words a lot, and, and they talk about all these theological things, and you wonder... Does that person actually live life like the rest of us humans? <laughs> no, Jesus was talking about what meets us here. Uh, he wasn't talking about something that uh, he'd been taught um, or a belief system that somebody had made up to deceive people. Um, it's not a fairy tale. We talked about that last week. That had been repeated over and over through generations in the past. No, he verified that he was an eyewitness to both the things that had happened on earth in plain view of humans, and he also intimated he was about to teach them and wanted to teach them about more heavenly things if he was ready to receive it. Now, secondly, Jesus knew Nicodemus really did believe him and believe in him, and he was teaching him to truly and fully trust in him, to rely on him for the truth, no matter what, whether he comprehended what was going on or not. Are we like that today? Do, do we sometimes... Do we really believe that God is really working out things for the best in our lives, even when we don't understand what he's doing in our life? Don't answer that out loud, because we're all saying, no, we don't sometimes. We do need to be reminded of that a lot. We can cling to Jesus as the clear implication here in our next life lesson is, you can trust what Jesus tells you about life here on earth, and you can trust what Jesus tells you about eternity. You can trust what Jesus tells you about life here on earth, and you can trust what Jesus tells you about eternity. Your faith and trust in Jesus grows as you believe what he says. Eleven times in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like, and then he tells a parable. Uh, I've 
dad always used to say, a, a parable is an earthly story to illustrate a heavenly thing. It's very much like a parent trying to tell a child about a dangerous situation. And sometimes you can draw a comparison to something the child has already seen or experienced, and sometimes not. You know? <laughs> you, they've got to trust that your analogy of what they do understand parallels the things they don't know. And that's what Jesus was saying here. And sometimes there's absolutely nothing in your prior life that you've experienced that equates to the situation you're about to go through. That's when the child has to totally trust the parents, completely trust and rely on him. We read in Matthew 19, 14, and in the other synoptic gospels, Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them for as such is the kingdom of heaven. It's that unwavering trust the little child has in their parents that God wants to see in each of us. Now, I hope I've been a good father. My girls are 28, 32, right girls? Are you listening? Um, <laughs> so it's been a while, but when they were little, I carried them in my arms, first rocked them in my arms, and, and then I carried them places. And, and then for fun, you know, I toss them up in the air and catch them. And, um, you know, for probably the first time or two, they kind of, oh, you know, kind of didn't want to be let go because they weren't sure what was going to happen as I, as I started to toss them. And, and then I go a little higher, a little higher. And, but they had that absolute trust that their father was there to catch them. And they knew it wouldn't be a problem. They thought, felt that weightlessness, that floating through the air is kind of, kind of fun, made them delighted. And, and um, they loved, they also loved to jump off the couch and to me and I would catch them. Um, then I'd tell them, close your eyes and jump. They didn't hesitate. Why? Because they knew I was there to catch them. Even blindly, when they couldn't see where they were jumping, their father said to jump and they jump. I said, don't jump until I tell you. <laughs> And don't jump after I tell you. Don't just walk up and crawl up on the couch tomorrow morning and start jumping blindly into nothing with your eyes closed, okay? Don't do that. So they, they knew they could trust their father when they couldn't even see him. And uh, I, honestly, it was a little sad when they got so big that I could no longer toss them up in the air and catch them. Um, they probably knocked me over if they jumped off the couch and <laughs> tried to catch me. I know for sure now they would. Um, but... Some, somehow they, they knew it would be a happy place when they weren't quite sure about where they would, would go. Um, you know, I could still hold their hand. I, I held their hand as we went places that were a little scary sometimes or they weren't sure of and, and also the happy places. And uh, finally, a few years ago, for, for each of them, I led them down, had my arm out and led them down the aisle to let them spend their life with someone else who would be taking care of them from that point on. And, and uh, and taking care of their children. And, and so, you know, we, we pass those things along and I hope I taught them in a way that they're, they can not only trust their earthly father, but they can trust their heavenly father in this same way, have that full reliance on them. Do you trust God when you can't see what's ahead? Thank God he's always there for us, always there for us. No matter if you can't see what, what's ahead, you can trust your heavenly father to catch you in your arms. If you feel like you're flying weightlessly, <laughs> and you don't see his arms there, they're, they're there. He will catch you. He'll hold your hand. He wants you to trust him, to get to know him, to believe him more and more every day. Um, and wasn't it good to dive into to the study of how Nicodemus came to understand how believing and trusting Jesus was changing his life there in front of Jesus. As you listen to the teaching of God's word, um, just keep reading, keep studying, and, and try, asking God for wisdom to understand what his word is speaking to you this week. Uh, jump into his arms, so to speak. And share with a few people that how Jesus has changed your life this week and, and how he has great plans for them as well. They may, it doesn't matter if they believe the Bible. It doesn't matter. You know, how do you believe? How does the Bible say that, that you gain, that people will gain belief in the Bible? By hearing the word of God. It's not by saying, oh, well, you don't believe it, I'm not gonna read it. No, it's by hearing the word of God. How is that verified in your life? They cannot deny your testimony. They cannot deny what the Lord has done for you in your life. And so both of those things, the word of God and the personal testimony. You see Jesus did that here in these verses as well. He said, I've seen these things. This is my testimony I've heard. And I will tell you more of the word of God. He, he was speaking God's word. So um, 
you know, get to know, get to know him, believe him. Are you listening to teaching his, his teaching? I hope so. Are you studying it more? I hope so. Let him know again. Share share those great plans with others. And if you have any questions about your relationship, or if there's anything you'd like Mitzi or I to pray for, uh, as we close up here, don't hesitate to ask one of us or, or one of our other brothers sisters here. And as we finish up verse 12 today, so next week we'll, we'll pick it up at verse 13. We'll move into some pretty incredible concepts first heard by Nicodemus, but so life-changing that we all need to share these things with us.